analysis of the balance sheet. The balance sheet can help us evaluate a company's liquidity and solvency. And as we saw with the income statement here, again, we look at common size analysis and the balance sheet ratios. With common size analysis, all balance sheet items are expressed as a percentage of total sales. With the income statement, all items were expressed as a percentage of sales. Here, all items are expressed as a percentage of total assets. What you are looking at here is a time series analysis. And note that cash 17% means that for the year ending 2005, the cash amount is 17% of total assets. Accounts receivable is 21% of total assets and so on. Similarly, total current liabilities are 7% of total assets. If you do a simple analysis here between 2004 and 2005, it looks like the cash position is improving, but accounts receivable position is deteriorating because the accounts receivable amount is going up 21% of total assets. So that seems to be a substantial increase from the previous year. Property, plant and equipment is a smaller percentage of total assets. Now you need to get into the details to understand how bad this is or what are the reasons for these changes. But effectively, looking at these percentages and how they change over time is called time series analysis. The curriculum gives an example of cross-sectional analysis where you are looking at these percentages or ratios for a given period across different companies. So if you have companies A, B and C and you see a cash percentage of 10% here, 20% here and 5% here and for accounts receivable you might see 20%, 17% and 4%. This is telling you about how these companies are managing themselves. Again, to really understand what is good or bad, you can look at industry averages. Within the industry, you can look at numbers or ratios for the best in class or the best players in the industry and then decide whether the company you are evaluating is doing well or not. Let's look at some important ratios now. There are two broad categories, the liquidity ratios, which we look at here, and solvency ratios on the next slide. Liquidity ratios tell us about a company's ability to meet current liabilities. There are three important liquidity ratios that you need to know. The one that is quoted most often is the current ratio. This is all current assets divided by current liabilities. Now, you might say that perhaps inventory is not too current. You might have a concern that the inventory might not be sold so easily. Then you can look at a slightly more conservative ratio, which is the quick ratio or the asset test. This looks at the major current assets minus the inventory. So cash, marketable securities and receivables divided by all liabilities. In some finance textbooks, you might actually see current assets minus inventory, but the CFA program curriculum gives us this formula. Now here again, you might say that receivables are not very liquid for a particular company. And then you can go to the most conservative ratio, which is cash and marketable securities divided by current liabilities. If these ratios are relatively high, and by relative, I mean relative to other companies in the industry, that means that the company has enough liquid assets to cover liabilities. In other words, its liquidity position is good. Short term obligations will be met. If the ratio is extremely high, then that might imply that the company is not managing its assets very efficiently. Coming now to solvency ratios. These ratios help us evaluate a company's ability to meet long-term and other liabilities. 
These ratios also help us evaluate a company's financial risk and leverage. Here are some of the commonly referenced solvency ratios. Long-term debt to equity. So let's say you have a company with the following balance sheet. Let's say assets are equal to 100. And on the right-hand side, you have liabilities. So liabilities, let's say short term debt is equal to 10 long term debt is equal to 30 and equity is equal to 60 so long term debt to equity ratio is going to be 30 over 60 the total debt to equity ratio is going to be 40 over 60 this is total debt to assets ratio which is equal to 40 divided by 100 and financial leverage ratio is the total assets divided by total equity. So in this particular example, the total assets are 100 divided by total equity, which is 60. This will give us the financial leverage ratio. In general, low ratios means that the company is safer. In other words, in general, you'll notice that debt is in the numerator. So if the debt number is relatively low compared to either assets or equity, then that means that the leverage is low. Leverage is a measure of how much debt a company has taken on. If the amount of debt is high, then the financial risk is high because high debt means that a company will have to make interest payments and those interest payments need to be made no matter what the operating income is. If a company in a given period generates very low operating income, but the debt level is high and the interest expense is high, then obviously the company faces a major financial risk. This last ratio deserves a few more words. Notice that we are dividing assets by equity. So you might think that we don't have any mention of debt over here. To understand this, let's look at a simple example. Say you have two companies A and B, both have assets worth 100. For company A, the debt is 20 and equity is 80. Whereas for company B, the debt is 80 and the equity is 20. If you look at the financial leverage ratio for A, it is assets 100 divided by equity. So this would be 100 over 80. Whereas for company B, it is going to be 100 divided by 20, which is equal to 5. So notice that debt is automatically considered this ratio of five is much higher than the ratio of 1.25 over here a high leverage ratio means a very high level of debt and hence high financial risk a few general remarks now about ratio analysis ratio analysis requires judgment for example We've talked about the current ratio, which is only a rough measure of liquidity. You might come up with current assets over current liabilities equal to 1.2. And you might conclude naively that we have enough assets to cover liabilities. However, on deeper analysis, you might realize that both the inventory and accounts receivables are not really very liquid. So the point here is that you need to do more analysis and rely on some judgment to really understand whether this ratio is safe or not. And you need to evaluate ratios in the context of the company's industry, as well as the particular situation of that particular company. You should also recognize that ratios are sensitive to end of period financing and operating decisions. Obviously, ratios are created based on numbers on the balance sheet. Balance sheet numbers are reported based on the last day of uh, operating period. Now, if a few days before that last day, a company sells a major piece of equipment and cash goes up, 
Now, the company has sold a long-term asset. Cash has gone up. So it might seem that the current ratio has become a whole lot better. But perhaps the company has compromised its ability to generate cash flow in the future. Or a company might have done a major financing operation which increases long-term liabilities and short-term cash or increases cash. That might make your liquidity ratios look much better than they might have been for most of the year. So as an analyst, you need to understand exactly what's going on. There is more on this material in a reading that we will be covering soon. So I would suggest that the ratio related examples that you see in this reading should be covered briefly now, but again in detail after you've done the reading on financial analysis techniques. So that brings us to the end of this reading. A brief summary. You need to understand the major current and non-current assets. One of the most important items to understand is the categorization of financial assets, the held for trading, held to maturity and AFS. You need to understand that unrealized gains are shown on the income statement across the board. For held for trading and AFS, the financial assets are shown at current fair value on the balance sheet. Unrealized gains are shown on the income statement for held for trading. Unrealized gains are shown as part of OCI in equity if the asset is classified as AFS. For held to maturity, unrealized gains are not recorded. You need to understand the major current and non-current liabilities. Understanding all the components of equity is important. The three major ones that you must know are the contributed capital or the stock, the retained earnings and other comprehensive income. Within other comprehensive income, there are four subcategories. The most important one for you at this stage is the unrealized gains with available for sale assets. And finally, analysis of the balance sheet. You need to understand the common sized balance sheets. Recognize that all numbers are expressed as a percentage of total assets. You can do both a time series analysis, which is looking at changes for a given company over a time period, or you can do a cross-sectional analysis, which is looking at multiple companies over the same period. And finally, you need to be on top of ratio analysis. You need to know all the liquidity ratios, and we talked about three of them. And you need to know all the solvency ratios, which essentially deal with debt and assets. As always, read the summary, review the learning objectives, do the examples to whatever extent possible. If the example seems very long, don't get hung up over the examples. The questions on the exam tend to be shorter. Spend a lot of time on the practice problems. They are very good, but as always, not quite enough. So if you can do practice questions from other sources, that will be very good for you. That is it.